Hello, everyone. Anything to anybody? Hello. Uh, tell me, tell me what happens. Your money is gone. <laughs> um, 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 go ahead. Last week, you said that Airbnb was going to be something on your radar. Airbnb was absolutely on my radar, and I was able to uh, benefit from that as a result. I did watch Fortuna, however, I didn't do anything with it. I just, I didn't feel the vibes with it. Um, I did something with Hecla, um, but it hasn't paid off yet. The miners in silver and gold this week got punished. Hecla re reported earnings this week on the 9th. And uh, who did? Hecla did. And I thought they met or exceeded their earnings, but they got punished nonetheless. It's important for people to understand. <clears throat> this is what I wanted to drive home. Yeah. When you make a trade and you get a profit, you have to take something off the table. You have to take something off the table. Absolutely. And so if Dan had said Airbnb is going to have great results, it's going to do great because of the earnings report, some people might have said, oh, well, I'll hold into earnings until the next day. When if you had done that, you were obliterated. You were obliterated because after hours when they reported, Airbnb dropped like 15%. And why didn't you hold it until earnings until after earnings if you thought earnings were going to be so great? Yeah, good, good, good. Very good point. I didn't hold it because um, <laughs> it was I in taking it off the table, I walked away with almost 37 percent. And my thoughts were I'm happy with 37%. If I can make 37% of my money in just a couple of hours every single time, I'll do that all day long. And my thoughts were- I've even, got the, even if you could make 130%? Um, well, that's a great point. So is the 130%- Because you remember what Jesse Livermore said, he made right. most of his money by doing nothing. Right, so my thoughts were, it, you know, I could make 130%, you know, the old adage is, you know, the one bird in the hand is usually worth uh, more than two in the bush. And that's how I looked at it. And so my thoughts were, yeah, it, it's exceeding earnings, it's doing well, but I'm, I'm up 37%. Um, my thoughts were, if I take this now, I've just locked in 37%. It, it's a guarantee take it off the table. I've locked it in. Could it go up 7,500, whatever, maybe. But on the other hand, my thoughts were, I'm happy with this profit range. In addition, from a risk mitigation standpoint, it might get shorted to all hell, right? Particularly after hours, which is when they tend to do stuff, when you can't do anything at that point. Why not go in with multiple contracts instead of one contract? You you go in with one contract, you have no flexibility at all. You have no options. You either sell or you hold. Whereas if you went in with four or ten contracts, you can you can de-risk yourself that way by saying, okay, I'm up 30%. Let me take three off and leave seven on. Yeah, so, so then another 30%, take another three off, leave the other four on. So let's say you've got two folks and um it doubles you want to take half off the table but what i find at least most of the time at least um with my trading is it <laughs> it doesn't always um work like that for me anyway it doesn't always uh, double sometimes it does but most of the time it, it just doesn't and it just doesn't work out that way so i'm more than happy uh well if your mind frame is is three days, how many things double in three days? Not a lot. So in the case of Airbnb on the first trade, it was um, 344, the second one was 229. What I walked away with, almost 600 right. bucks on the- Again, the question was, why don't you use multiple contracts? Well, sometimes I do, sometimes I do. It depends on 
uh, how I feel about the risk. And it depends on not only risk mitigation, but also cash management as well. How much cash I want to allocate towards the cost basis. That's a so factor. If you look at your well. average trades, you wouldn't want the flexibility of having the freedom and peace of mind to be able to take money off the table and still have something still left on the table? So, so yes and no, yes and no. So, um, so let's say you go in with two contracts, like I did with Airbnb on the second trade, I went in with two instead of one. And let's say I took half off the table at 37%. And let's say I held it overnight. If I had done that, um, Airbnb went down the toilet overnight and into the next day, I would no, have been no, but on Monday, if you had had two contracts on Monday. Yeah, I mean, on Monday, it might have worked. But there's a lot of times when I've seen where, yeah, you take one off the table and then the stock goes into the toilet. And now the earnings um, that I would have achieved doing that are actually less than when I had taken just the one and the whole thing off the table. I have found a lot of times, not always, not always, but a lot of times, at least for me. Yeah, I know you say you're not a day trader, but in my, what it sounds like to me is a lot of your trades, you buy and sell on the same day. I'd say a majority of your trades. Uh, I wouldn't say the majority. Well, let me no. rephrase it. In and out no. within 24 hours. Maybe not the same day, but within 24 hours. 24 to 48, uh, that might be true, yeah. When you trade options, you know, there's theta. So, which is one of the Greeks and that's time decay. Absolutely. The and window. So when you, when you have an, when you buy an option, every day you hold it, if the price stays flat, you're losing. You are, you're, you're, you have to basically make gains to stand still. And that's the danger of buying options that are expiring too soon because time, you want time to be your friend, not so, your enemy. So on most of the first thing I do when I'm looking, going long, if I'm buying a call is um, I usually start two weeks out, two weeks out. And then from there, I'm either I come back in a week or I'll go out an additional week. It, it just depends on the strike price and it depends on the implied volatility. And then uh, mostly it depends on the delta and the cost basis or cash I'm willing to allocate towards towards uh, towards the particular symbol, I guess. Yeah, me, me personally, uh, two weeks is way too short for me. I only do two weeks if I'm planning to go in and out within a day or two. What happens is sometimes things happen and now you either have to sell at a loss or adjust your well, position it, or hold. And if it, you only bought two weeks out, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead in the water. Well, it you have no flexibility or saving grace when you buy that short of a time frame. And yeah, well, the, the downside of going out a month or three months or six months is you have to pay more for the option. That too. You, everything is about time with options. You pay for time. Mm -hmm. You pay for time. That's absolutely. So if you want a bigger window, you're going to alloc you're going to have to allocate, uh, more funds towards it. Yep. Absolutely. So if you only yeah. wanted to risk a thousand dollars, exactly, then that's where the shorter duration comes in mm -hmm. and also adjusting the strike price. You just have to make sure that you have a plan in place. If that goes against you, you're taking your loss and you're moving on or you're adjusting it in some way, like you roll it. Yeah. Before you get too close to expiration, because if you wait to the week of expiration, you probably are not going to get anything of value from that to roll. Very little. Yeah. So I just wanted to start with that because Dan handled that masterfully as far as I think uh, I've been telling Dan he should try to go two contracts, get comfortable with that. And I do on some of them, but but yeah. you're right. Yeah, I probably should do because, it on all, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's um, no argument. Yeah. I mean, because if you're going to trade, uh, I mean, like with your win rate. Yeah. I mean, it would support 
two contracts because you don't have an 80% loss ratio where two contracts would just increase your losses. <laughs> also, Dan has the discipline to take money off the table. Instead yeah, of, pretty good like you way. said, he's not thinking about the bird in the bush. He's thinking about the bird, the bird in hand. And pretty he's much. taking the guarantee return. And it's a good point. I mean, if you could make 10% a day on your money, would you be happy with that? Oh. I think anybody, I mean, a lot of people are like falling all over themselves saying happy days are here again because market market money markets are now paying five or six percent when they've been paying like two percent for the last 20 years 10 years so, so and that's for a year so good point my average so far this month i'm running at about 25.7 percent there's like three markets or three um not markets but three indices that most people use as a gauge oh absolutely right the spy the Qs, and the russell i know there's the dow jones as well and there's others but those are the three major ones that people usually <clears throat> determine how well the market's doing my understanding is the most broad inclusive whatever biggest is the russell right because the russell i think has like five thousand companies in it something it's it's four thousand the s p is only 500 the top 500 yep and the dow is like so the s p yeah. are the the biggest 500 companies are the most influential yeah yeah and the, and Qs, the Qs are tech stocks uh you, when you say the Qs, are you talking nasdaq correct yeah yeah so just for the late people out there just say nasdaq so it's an exchange well if we're talking the health of an economy. It seems like the United States has become, everybody thinks the economy is synonymous with the stock markets, <laughs> right? Yeah. So Main Street and Wall Street, there's been a massive disconnect in my humble opinion for I don't know how long, but yeah, absolutely, man. What would it tell you if all three of those indices were either ripping higher or crashing badly. That would basically be a confirmation that there is an extreme direction in one way, right? Yeah. Like back in 2020, I suspect all three of those indices were going like this in early 2020, March 2020. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So what does what would it say if Two of them are dropping and one is rising. Is money rotating or is one Good indice? Point. It's kind of like housing, like the build, the home, the home builders right now. The home builders have been popping a rod the last couple months. Builder symbol BLDR has gone up 25%, I think, in two months, maybe a month. Yeah, but, you know, to your point, I think sooner or later, I'm starting to see reports where um, uh, I think it's in Alabama is a good example where builders or Arkansas, I think, or Arkansas have built all these houses for or five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, these houses and nobody's buying them right now. They're just sitting there. And the problem is for the local people that live in that area and region. The, the 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 average income, I think per capita, they said it's like thirty G's a year, thirty grand a year. So you're making thirty thousand dollars. You're the local people. You can't buy a, a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. You're not going to qualify. So you're going to ask these people making twenty eight, thirty G's a year now. They're going to buy a five hundred thousand dollar house. No, no. The builders put those houses in with the intent of relocating, probably from California, New York, wherever. Right. That, that sold their piece of junk in Cali or New York for 1.1 million, come down there and, and now they can purchase this house for 400 G's, 500 G's with cash and bank the rest of it, right? But if that's not happening right now for umpteen reasons, now the builders are holding the bag, right? And, the, and they've got to hold on to this stuff and start cutting prices to get it eventually, the inventory off their books, right? And that's where 
Berkshire Hathaway comes in, BlackRock and all those cats. That's what they're doing. They're salivating. They're praying every day that this continues to go like this. Yeah. Because they're, well, they're yeah. going to walk in for pennies on the dollar on those homes. That's what they're going to do. Well, they Darryl. work with the banks and the banks. So what happens is if these companies can't afford to hold their inventory, you know, the other thing in property, people who are actually building homes and selling them mm. or even flippers, people who flip homes, yeah, they usually don't buy these things on a 30 year mortgage. They typically get an adjustable yeah. like one year or six month. And then they, cause they typically don't plan on holding these things for that long. Oh yeah. yeah. And so what we just talked about with the options, you go into it thinking one thing and then you have to shift. And what's happening now is let's say, Dan, these people actually finance these properties they're building at three or five percent. And now they have to come back in. And they either have to sell these things for what they can get or they have to refinance it at eight or ten percent. These companies aren't in business to carry huge amount of cost. You know, they want to build it, sell it, build it, sell it, build yeah, they it, gotta, sell it. They have to keep rotating, turning stuff over um, with a short duration. Yeah. So when these all. stocks are reporting numbers, and even though the numbers are dropping, they're still profitable, everybody forgets. When they report numbers, that's the rearview mirror. It's that's not what the It's not what the future current is. And what do we always say? If you want to be a good investor, a good trader, you have to see where the puck is going to be in a month or six months or in a year. You can't just say, oh, well, they're doing great right now. That's not going to help you. Agreed. And That's so when point. things get so skewed higher and you're looking at it saying, what am I missing here? So, and there are leading and lagging indicators. And this is where you have to really develop a system. And so that's why I say, these three indices, not all of them are leading indicators. Some of them are lagging. Most of them are lagging. And so you have to figure out, okay, if two of the indices are, are turning red and one of them is trying to pop a rod, what, which one of these is not like the other? And instead of going full speed ahead saying, we're going to the moon, maybe people should say, hey, maybe there's some red flags here or maybe they're as a short opportunity rather than a long opportunity because the most successful traders can trade both ways. Long and, and short. You, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Long and short. And the problem is, is for the last 20 years, nobody's had to really short. All you had to do is just put your money in Apple and say, Hey, let's go play golf or let's go to the beach. And you made a killing. Yeah. Since 2009, 10 timeframe, something like that last 12, 13 years. By and large, yeah. So the SPY is the, the S&P 500. So last week, last Friday, it closed at 412.63. And yesterday, it closed at 411.59. Most of the week, it was uh, up, but it closed down. And then we have the Russell... And the Russell last Friday closed at 174.45. And yesterday it closed at 172.72. The Russell by far is the weakest of the three exchanges. And it's probably because it has a lot of those smaller banks in them. We have the NASDAQ, the Qs. And last Friday it closed at 322.89. And yesterday it closed at 325.03. It was a very strong week for NASDAQ, but it, it, had a, it had a hiccup yesterday. And it will be very interesting to see if we are now seeing a topping process and a turn, especially with this debt ceiling stuff going on, with the bank issues going on. I think we're going to see people getting a little bit nervous. In addition, as we saw yesterday, the dollar... The dollar went to, I think, I what did I tell you, a three-month high yesterday? I think so. The DXY? Yeah. That's not good for uh, commodities, and it's not good for the stock market. 
And if you look at DXY yeah. on February 1st, it was it acted like what it acted like yesterday in March. The DXY went up about 5%. It went from 101 to like 105. I, I joined a trading group and they had a, a certain trade on and it was a scenario that I had never seen before. Yep. <clears throat> and um, that was a learning experience. <laughs> that was a learning experience. And unfortunately, I didn't, in, re in hindsight, I didn't, I didn't handle it the best way that I could have. And that's, that's the process of learning. And that's one reason why I joined this group is to try to get into trading a different style that's not comfortable or not something that I would normally do. And maybe it will expand my horizon on trading or see things differently than I do. And that's why I do it. Absolutely. And, and I can say the same as well. I think it's good to get exposed. Uh, to different people and different techniques just to see, you know, um, what you're comfortable with, I guess, versus what you're not. And I think in doing that, too, it kind of can magnify uh, your strengths in a way, if that makes sense. So, Well, we've talked about this, and, and I'm guilty of this. I, yeah. I, I, am, I am, was my own worst enemy, and it's something that I'm now cognizant of. Yeah. Is Now I'm constantly like, what am I ignorant of? And ignorance doesn't mean you're a moron. It just means you don't know. Exactly. You, you just don't know. You, you don't know what you don't know. And that's dangerous. Because when you don't know that you're putting yourself in danger, you don't even know to be what to be fearful of. And that's one reason why I expose that's myself point. to other people. Because now I'm like, whoa, I never knew I was doing this incorrectly before, or I didn't know that there was a better way to do it. Absolutely. And that's the whole thing. If I you agree. can do something better, why wouldn't you want to? Is when the markets shift, your strengths may now be a weakness. Absolutely. So if you can't pivot, Absolutely. if you don't know how to pivot, you're dead. Is if you don't know the benefit of using a butterfly or a strangle or a straddle or a calendar put, you don't, it, it's an ignorance that you may be costing yourself money. Uh, at least in the form of opportunity cost is probably truth to that. Yeah. Right. Or identifying when to put on a hedge to protect your position. As we've talked about. I mean, if yeah. you see a potential that your position could possibly drop 50% in the next X amount of months. Yeah. Like, let's say you hold... Let's say you hold a um, thousand shares of Apple and uh -huh. Apple's at 173 right now. Yeah. And the potential is Apple could drop back to 129 in a couple months. Are you just going to say, okay, I'm going for the ride. What are some things that you could do, Dan, besides selling your position? If you wanted to hold that, what could you do? Well, if you think that there's a, 50, let's say you say it's a 30% chance that it could drop back to a lower price, say 130. Yeah. So there's different ways, I guess, and techniques to hedge that. Um, a simple technique would be perhaps to at the right strike price and duration, I guess, um, buy a put. So let's say Apple continues to go up then you're not really making as much money as you would have, but you have the protection to the downside. To the downside, correct. And if it goes down, then you're looking at the same type of thing, is you're looking at it reducing the amount of loss that you're taking. Yeah. And you have to pay for that insurance. You have to buy that contract. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, stock uh, prices, guys, as you know, move in – how many directions? Three, right? Up, down, and sideways. But most of the time, I mean, even if it's moving sideways, there's an up to it and a down to it. There's a range. And if Apple's here, let's say, at 160, and you think in the short term it could drop to 130, and if it's at the top part of the range currently, let's say it's double or triple topping if you make a horizontal line, and you think it's a good chance that it can go down, you could still hold the shares 
uh, without taking a loss. Um, and like I said, hedge in the form of buying a put, and then you could uh, make some money as it's going down. And then when it gets to the lower range, um, provided you're correct, expect the bounce again to get back to where you were and either break even at that point without taking a loss, or if you're lucky, maybe it breaks through the ceiling and keeps going. So these are things you have to take into mind, but yeah. Most people who invest in the stock market, I'll bet you just buy and hold. Absolutely. They don't trade actively. They don't take advantage of the volatility, the up and downness, if you will. Yeah. And if you look at any stock, you know, the thing that really enrages me is when they're like, yeah, just put it in your account, never look at it. Over the course of the history of the stock market, it's gone up an average of 10% when it looks like this on the chart. Mm -mm 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 -mm. When if you actively managed your money, you know, you could definitely increase your returns. Dude, that's a great point because, guys, the way everything is set up, and I've only learned this over the last few years, the whole system is designed in such a way to take advantage of you. It literally is. So what, what do I mean? The system is designed for you to get your paycheck, whether you get it deposited, uh, you know, electronically as a salaried person or you get paid once a week as an hourly person. The system is designed for your money, X amount of it after Uncle Sam takes his portion to go into an account, either a savings account into the bank or into a 401 account, you know, through your employer. Then in turn, the Wall Streets of the world take your money in which they just want you to buy and they want you to hold because when you just buy and hold and you don't actively manage your money, that's not really benefiting them. What benefits them is they get the collective share of all of us to buy and like sheeple just hold. And then what they do is they take our money and they utilize it in massive blocks of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions at times. And if they only make a quarter percent, 25 basis points, 50 basis points that day, you're like, well, what's that? That's nothing. Well, if you're trading hundreds of millions or billions of dollars and you made 25 basis points, do the math. You just made millions of dollars that day. And they did it with your money, with your money. They used your money to trade, basically. They don't tell you that. But that's what they do. And guess who keeps the profits? Do you think they distribute any of the profits with you and me, even though they used your money? Same thing with the banks, right? They give us like 1% interest, but they charge 8% on a car loan, you know, uh, you know, 6% on a mortgage and 22% on the credit card. And they pay you and me 1%. What a business, huh? So when you take control and you manage your own money, now you're taking uh, advantage of what's going on in the market and the volatility and so forth. It's not easy. It takes time to learn this, etc. But they just want you to buy and hold. And oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, particularly with the 401k, buy and hold. And I'm going to charge you between a one and two percent fee every single year of what's in your account. They're not doing anything, but they're charging you one percent fee. And so you're like, well, it's only 1%. What's the big deal, Dan? Well, you're talking if it's an ETF. I'm talking uh, if it's a uh, 401k plan, it's an FBO for benefit of. That's another thing they don't tell you. You technically don't own the money. Uh, it's for benefit of, right? So in a way, what they're saying is in legalese terms is, is that because you parked your money in this 401k with us, with Fidelity or whomever, we technically own it, not you. Okay. And we give you the benefits of it, but we actually own it and we actually take your money and trade with it so that we can make money. What, what a deal, huh? So, you know, that's just some stuff I wanted to add it to your point, Dave, that I guess what I'm saying, folks, is you got to be more active with your money and not just blindly throw it in an account and think that some advisor is going to look look after you and take care of it. They're not. They're not. They're, you know, the average broker and stuff is just going to tell you to buy and hold because as the account gets bigger, he makes more money. That's all. He either churns your account or, or and or he makes more money as the thing grows uh, from the fees. 
you know, 1% of a hundred dollars versus 1% of a thousand, right? This is the stuff they don't tell you. So this is on my diatribe, the financial education at large that is totally lacking in the United States. And it's all by design. It's all by you know, design. Like the ARC fund, right? The ARC fund, you're paying, you're paying a fee to Kathy Wood and her crew to lose your money. <laughs> or even if they break even, you're still losing money. Yeah. So if you just leave your money there, they're taking money out it every quarter. Yeah, no, it's a joke, dude. It really is a joke. Um, you know, this is what I've learned the last five or 10 years. Um, uh, it, it's, they use our money for everything. Another example would be at a geopolitical level. I mean, you know, what you alluded to earlier, Dave, not to diatribe too much. I mean, take the Ukraine. It's a perfect example. Our tax money is funding all this bullshit, right? Uh, but they yet they don't ask us, you know, what what our thoughts are on it. They just it's take called, them. It's called money laundering. Dan. They just take the money and uh, they do it. So so now what's happening in the Ukraine real quick is Zelensky, this stooge that we installed 10 years ago. Most Americans aren't aware of this. We propped him up is now having talks as we speak with the Black Rocks of the world. Black Rock already owns 30 percent of the country. And now they're going to en end up owning, what, 50%, 80% when all is done? So in other words, they allowed the war to happen. They allowed the infrastructure and everything to get torn up and brutalized. And now they're going to swoop in on pennies on the dollar and say to Zelensky and team, yeah, we'll rebuild everything. We'll rebuild your infrastructure. We'll fund it all. But, oh, by the we'll give you the money to do that. But, um, you know, we'll loan it to you. But then you're going to take, you know, six decades paying us back while we own everything. Yeah. All at the be all at the behest of the U.S. taxpayer. Thank you very much. Newsflash: They don't tell you that in the regular news, do they? I don't think so. I don't think the Cartoon News Network will tell you that. I'm pretty sure Fox won't tell you either. Well, actually, Tucker Carlson tried to tell you that, and you know what they did with him a month ago. So you know, I don't know, man. This is why you got to manage your affairs, folks. I'm no expert. I'm learning every day. I make mistakes like the next guy. So does Dave. But I don't know any other way. And you've got to teach your children, too. Because the only thing we teach is just, you know, uh, go to school, get a degree, if it's worth anything, and then go work for somebody. And we know how that works. Yes, so. indeed is we're talking about the example of Apple. So I have Apple right here. If you're a buy and hold type person, you can look at a chart here and you can see that Apple, it's currently at uh, 170, what was it? 172.57. So the 52 week range, the high is 176, the 52 week range, right? Yeah. So that means that's the highest price Apple has recorded in the last year. So we're at the upper end of the range right now. So if you're a buy and hold person, okay, could it go to 190? Yeah, it could. But let's look at the chart. So here's the five-year chart. And you can see, just like we've talked before, it's been up, 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 up with some dips. Up, up but if you away. look at the last the last five years, the last five years, that 52 week high is pretty close to the all time high. So if you wanted to hedge that now, if you think it's going higher, then maybe you hedge it a little bit differently. But the way I look at it is, is I think one of the things that people can do is not just buy a put. But Dan, one of the things you can do and make e and then you can make money instead of paying for it is you can sell a covered call. Yeah, so if you have a thousand shares and let's say we look at that chart and and this is the thing is is you can say, okay, um, Apple could go to 180 and I'd be happy selling these shares at 180. And you say, so you can do a couple things. You can either choose a short term. So I could go out to June 
And June 16th is the next major uh, options expiration after May 19th. So we're looking at selling a covered call. And if we say we want to sell at $180, this is the June 16th. $180 call, they're going to pay me $1.62 per share to sell a covered call. So what that means is if Apple goes up, if it goes above 180, then we are obligated to sell our shares at 180 and we're paid $1.62 per share. So at a thousand shares, I would be collecting $1,620, a thousand shares times 1.62. So I would sell those shares at 180. Now, if Apple went to 190, I'd have to sell them at 180 and I'd collect the 162. But here's the thing. If we're in rocky times and the shares are most likely going to drop, then I keep the shares. So let's say the price on June 16th is 150. I still have the shares and I collect the dollar 62. In fact, if you think the price is going down, what you might want to look at is, yeah, I think the price could get to 120 in six months, right? This is an, another aggressive strategy. So six months from now is November. So if I go out to November 17th, yep, and I say, okay, what if I if I choose a hundred and fifty dollar strike? Look at this, Dan. Yeah, so thirty bucks, right? One I mean, I mean, a uh, hundred, a hundred times thirty, right? So one contract pays you how much? That's three grand. Three grand. So if I had a thousand shares, oh my goodness, how much is it paying me? <clears throat> you do touch on a a, a a cogent point here overall, which is aside from getting into these uh, particulars, you know. Hmm. Sooner or later, right, the market's going to turn and that upward wedge 45 degree that we've experienced for 10 or 12 years is going to turn into a 45 degree downward wedge, right? And the point is, folks, what Dave's saying is you got to be able, besides going long and trending up, <laughs> you better have skills to be able to trend down and act short, actually, and or hedge, Right. That's what you're getting at overall, correct, Dave? Right? Well, I mean, Dan, that's important. Dan, it's imp you got to go both ways. You right? don't have to go that far back, Dan, to see this. Last year was one of the worst years in stock market history. Right. Right. If somebody, if somebody in January had implemented a covered call for to protect themselves, okay. Yeah. Because listen, on my other computer, I have it up in front of me. So you don't have, you can do them a month at a time instead of going six months. And it may be better because if I just go out to July, it's amazing. If you look at any stocks, it's amazing how many inverted bells we see. Because they were down here, they, they, were, they were basically down here, yep. and then they went up. And now they're back down where they came. So they went up and now they're back. And so if those people at the highs decided that they didn't want to sell their shares, which that's another topic that Dan is and and I have addressed is you gotta have the discipline to sell at least a portion off the table. What's what the you do, what's the, so for the person who has a thousand shares of Apple? You could go out, you could sell a covered, you could sell a hundred and fifty dollar covered call. Now remember your goal right now, if you think the market is gonna vomit and you don't want to lose your money, okay, you can sell a hundred and fifty dollar covered call and you can the market will pay you twenty-five dollars per share. So on those thousand shares, the market would give you in your account. $25,000 for the right to buy your shares at $150 on July 21st. So if we get to July 21st and the shares are now worth $149, you keep your shares and you keep the $25. 
Yeah. So in essence, mean, in essence, your shares are still worth 175 in your account. You hedged yeah. yourself. Right. To, to the downside. So when do you, you buy? Understand? Let me, when, do you understand that, Dan? When do you buy a covered calls? Just so that everybody understands. When, when's a good time to buy a covered call? What's like the purpose and stuff? And you own physical shares. Yeah. Say a hundred shares and um, you want to make additional money on those shares by holding them, right? Well, what we're not going to do on this video is we're not going to, we've talked about calls and puts and stuff before. Otherwise this will be an hour long. There's plenty of information on how to trade options good information out there. Specifically, um, we Lowell, I forget the name of his channel, something investor, uh, options trader. Excellent. He's fantastic. He's very He's good. got a great book that Dan and I have read that yep. is, I can't recommend it high enough. The guy, the guy changed my life. We Lowell. It's fantastic. Absolutely. Spot on. Even if you, if you know nothing, you will read that book. And you will now have a working understanding will get you up and running just from reading his book. Strongly recommend it. Go to his YouTube channel. He's fantastic. Lee Lowell. I'll put a link to this yeah. video. To his I channel. watch he, him. He's, he's I, awesome. uh, I watch we should, him. We should, we should have a discussion with him. 100%. I watch a lot of his videos. He is excellent. But I think in this current economic climate with so much uncertainty, you could buy a put but you have to pay money for the put. I think a, a better option is to choose a ridiculously low strike price. And people like, I don't want to lose my shares. Or what if I lose my shares? Okay, let's say Apple does go to 190 and you lose your shares. You, you lose your shares. You lose your shares at 150, but you were paid $25. So your shares are gone at 175. Well, you can turn around and sell a put contract or outright buy the shares again. But obviously, there are, are ways that you can get the shares back. There's, there's a risk with any strategy, but that's an opportunity cost. But if your shares go to 150, that's real. That's real. So there are other ways that you can hedge, but those are the two main ones. And... And I strongly encourage people to, if you are a buy and hold person, trust me when I say this, if you read Lee Lowell's book, you can pick up these basic, basic of selling puts, selling covered calls, buying calls, buying options. It is really the only way to trade in the markets, in my opinion. The only advantage of holding shares is if you are taking a dividend. If you hold stocks that pay no dividends, you can you can hold options for a lot less money. You can have in in most cases. So I strongly encourage take a couple hours, read his book. It, it might change your life, your your trading life, your financial life. So because I've tried to help, I know people who have different stock positions. And I've tried to explain this to them, and they're just too afraid. They're like, uh, options are too dangerous. Um, no, I don't want that risk. The way I just explained it is there's risk, but the way I just explained that covered call, you're going to make money either way. You may not make the maximum amount, but you just, you just protected yourself on the downside. And you still made money. That's about, I mean, that I would take that situation every time when I trade, wouldn't you? Is I would rather take a little bit of maximum potential off the table, but still make a lot of money. Like you said, Dan, you'd take 10% a day if you could, rather than trying to hit a home run. Hey, if you think about it, 2% a day. You know, if you're executing an options trade and I'm making even 20%, 30%, like I did on the two Airbnbs this week, 64% and 37% respectively. Where the hell are you getting 64 and 37, whatever the average, whatever it is, 50% on your money? 
I don't know anywhere. The loan sharks. Yeah, maybe that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh, Louie and Joey. Yeah.